Hi, I'm Michael London, and welcome to Spidcast, the future of collaborative video production brought to you by SpidVid.com. On this episode, we're visiting with Richard Wigand. He is an independent producer. He produces a very cool web show called Curve Your Vampirism. We'll hear more about that in just a little bit. And he's brought with him a very special guest, a very recognizable face if you watch episodic TV at all, especially the dramas. All coming up in just a moment on Spidcast. So let's jump right in. Richard, welcome to Spidcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Michael. So, Richard, tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into producing your own web series. A couple of years ago, I uh, started making small videos for the Internet, for my YouTube account. And I've, I've always wanted to do episodic different kinds of things, and I wanted to branch my stories and create different kinds of characters. And, and creating a web series allowed me to put my ideas together and, and post it out there and, and get instant feedback. And how did you break into the filmmaking world? I always kind of had this creative mind and thinking. I, I, I perceive the whole world as, as, you know, one giant film. Everything that I see. And my mind creates the characters, the dialogue, and, and all that stuff. It, it comes by watching television and movies, and I get, I get an idea of how I, I would... I get an idea of, of how I piece a, a film together. And ever since I was real little, I've, I've, I've always wanted to do this. And when I first got a camera, I was just able to... To film, you know, different ideas that were in my head, and and uh, that's how that all came about. After you get that idea and after you put it into motion, I'm going to guess that collaboration comes into play in a big way. Tell us about how collaboration has benefited your web series. For this web series in particular, I I, uh, I collaborated mostly with my sister Rosella, just going back and forth with different ideas that we would come up with for the show. We're both on the show, we're, we're both actors, and and allowing her to take some of the. Uh, the directing task of it, but, but outside of that, it was really uh, a neat experience to get back in touch with my friends through uh, Facebook to, to cast them in, in one of the parts in, in one of the episodes. And the most interesting thing about this series is that I got to collaborate with some companies from the United Kingdom. You know, people all the way over there that, uh, that were piecing our music together. And, and that was really a true inspiration to uh, begin the series. Collaboration is what it's all about these days. What are some tips for some young filmmakers out there trying to get the most out of a limited or no-budget situation? Well, for one thing, uh, having no budget has never stopped me from doing what I want to do. And I've all, I'm have i always about the story and the characters. And if there's something really important that I, that I think should be said in what I film, you know, ha- having no budget or having limited sets, uh, using the same sets over and over again, it, it doesn't take me out of my vision for what I'm doing. And as long as I, I get it out there and I'm happy with the performances, the editing, and everything, having no budget or limited budget doesn't restrict me. Uh, I, I think I could come up with more creative ideas if I don't have much to play around with. And, and that's what really impresses people. You know, not having a, a big whole lot of uh, financial support uh, can pull off a big project or a small project. And I think that people are really impressed with what I can do uh, at the budget level that I'm at. Excellent. So little or no budget, you get it done. But once you get it done, once you get that product finished and you get it onto the web, how, how do you get people there? How do you get noticed? I, I use Facebook to get out there uh, with my friends. Uh, I have to say that Twitter is the best way for this web series to get out there because my, my sister and I started a Twitter, uh, at Curve underscore vampirism to get our series out there and we started doing it before the show even started and and my character Vladimir tweets to people and people tweet back to him and they're kind of getting inside the world of, of curvy vampirism and, and getting people you know excited about it and, and it was a really cool thing to see that not only are, are people you know following the show but they're also following the Twitter that is part of the show and they want more out of it and they want to see more and, and that was really cool uh, but Twitter has overall been the best way for our show to be seen it's also a really important thing to get instant feedback that they love Vlad or they love what he does and they want to see more. It inspires me to want to create more and it inspires me to want to take the world to a whole new level and, and they're part of it too. Well, talking about characters, it's a character that we know from a TV show we love. You brought a very special guest with you today. Uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce him? Yes, I would like to introduce you all to actor, filmmaker, musician James Page Morrison. How are you, James? Hi, Richard. How are you, man? 
Not too bad at all. I, I'm really glad that you decided to do this. It, it's really cool. Um, um, since this is an audio podcast, let's give a face to the name of James Page Morrison. Uh, where have we seen you lately? <laughs> uh, let's see. I, I, uh, well, I spent four years as Bill Buchanan on 24 on Fox. And um, on the big screen, let's see, you would have seen me as the person who inspired uh, Leonardo DiCaprio to become a pilot in Catch Me If You Can. I'm the cat who went through the hotel, and he said, oh, you know, I want to be that guy. And, you know, lots and lots of uh, episodic television, lots of series. To Space Above and Beyond, I was Colonel McQueen on Fox uh, for the sci-fi fans. I'm just going to go right into it, because the reason I chose to talk to you is not only are you an actor, filmmaker, musician, but you've also used parts of the social media like Facebook and Twitter to, to kind of get your ideas and your projects out there. So I'm, I'm wondering, how has Twitter changed your life? Well, I, don't, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it has changed my life as, as much as it's just given it another way to uh, be, I don't know, revealed is not a good word, but to certainly to, to, to interact. And I was, you know, I was listening to you. Uh, talk about this, and I, it, it reminded me of back when we used to, you know, first started doing theater when I was a young actor in, in, uh, in, um, smaller theater in LA and, and, uh, in, in, in the, the few places that I did in New York 30 years ago, and, and, and any, any theater you do really, back before the internet, you would try to drum up word of mouth, and that's basically what we're doing with Twitter. Is it's, it's just a word of mouth audience until it starts to catch on, and, it, and if it doesn't, it's because we didn't have the elements that were necessary for it to catch on. But uh, you know, you you use any means possible to to promote yourself as an artist, and I think it's just a a great way to 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 uh, reach out and expand your audience. It's also a really cool thing to be able to talk to the fans and have them, you know, instantly give you feedback if they saw you on the show the night before. They, they, they can tweet that to you and you say thank you or whatever. I think it's it's really a big deal when they get a response. It's it's inspirational to hear from, uh, you know, you, you get to see the performance and you get to respond to your favorite actor. But you know, it also means a lot to the artist, especially those of us who are who are sort of crossover, you know, artists who. Or, I don't know, multidisciplinary, I guess. So those of us who make music and, and or who write or or direct as well as act, you know, there, there's a, there's constantly a way to keep people informed of that. Uh, if if we can't afford the the you know ten or twenty thousand dollar a month PR firm to do it for us, it's 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 a way, and it's also like you say, a way to to maintain contact with the very people we want to reach, right? Do you ever get tired of hearing the same messages over and over again? No, you know, because they, um, it's it's the feedback that you you know that you don't get from working in television and film uh, that you do get when you're on stage. You know, the applause never sounds the same. It never feels the same when it's that live feeling of of, of the, the the laugh that comes back to you. Uh, you know, from the dark. It's never the same. I mean, it could be, I guess, you could say that it's the same every night, but it's not, because it's in the moment. So if you hear a, 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 two people say the same thing, they're really saying it from a from a, a very personal place, and I think that's the, I don't know, that's the best example I can give of that. No, I don't tire of that at all. How long have you been tweeting? Um, let's see, I discovered uh, Twitter when I was in Canada to... Uh, to It'll be two years ago, uh, just last April, so just a little over two years, I was up there doing a benefit for the Canadian Cancer Society, and I'd heard that, uh, that Mary Lynn uh, uh, Reiskub, who played Chloe on 24, was, was on it, and John Kassar as well. And so I, I just went on to check it out. Of course, I'd heard of it, because I guess it had, what, it's been five years now, Twitter's, Twitter's been around. <laughs> and, I, and so I just checked it out, and I went, you know, this, wow, this is interesting. How did I not know this was here? <laughs> Because I like to—I mean, I'm—I like to converse, especially about you know cur current events and, and social issues, and and as you know from following me and, and from the things that I that I talk about uh, on Twitter. The documentary that you tweet about. So just what's going on in the world. I mean, it affects us as as human beings, and if, and if you're connected as a human being, it's going to in an artist, it's going to affect. You know, you're, I think it, it should affect, it should have a, uh, an impact on what you create as an artist. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, and now, of course, it's where I get all my news. I mean, you can't, you know, I trust 
the sources on Twitter more than I trust to the certainly the mainstream media. That's the way that everyone is looking at in the world. You you've collaborated with filmmakers in both the television and the film world. I'm very interested in knowing what would you say to those out there who use the internet as their television and film world. Well, um, you know, it's just I mean I'm still I'm still beginning to understand all that. Um, I'm sort of I'm sort of old school in that. Uh, I mean I still watch TV. I still go out to the movie, movie theaters and. And, and, and not quite as much now, you know, that I have a child, but I, I like to go to live theater. I mean, I, I think there's a, I think you have to find balance. And uh, I think that's what I would say is, you know, just like I read today on Twitter, as a matter of fact, don't, uh, I think it was, in fact, I think it was the president who said this. Don't get all your information from one source and uh, question the sources that you have. If you're, if you're getting all your, your information, or if you're using only one medium, as a sort of a uh, hitching post, you know, untie, get out there and ride around a little bit. That's that's the that's the advice I would give. It, it was Twitter that I I found out that not only do you act and have the documentary, you know, the film that you've been producing, but you you're also a songwriter and a musician. For, for those out there who don't know that you're a musician, what kind of music do you write and perform? Uh, well, I guess it's a folk rock. You know, it's a I was influenced by the. The '60s bands like the Birds and, and and Dylan, of course, and and uh, and all the different groups that came out of Buffalo Springfield and those guys, you know, that sort of sound, that sort of cosmic country, Graham Parsons thing. So I was I was influenced by the Grateful Dead and and those guys, and, and you know, groups like Canned Heat that came out of the Woodstock era. In fact, Larry Taylor, the bassist for Canned Heat, played on my album uh, "Son to the Boy," which has been out for. A little while, and, and uh, we're just starting to tour uh, to play live to, to promote it. But so that was kind of cool to play with Larry. So it's that sort of thing, you know. Why did you choose the internet? Uh, well, mostly because it's just so immediate. I mean, you can, you know, and and, and people are so connected to the digital download. Um, and also uh, because I was self-produced, I'm not I'm not affiliated with a label. It seems the the, the most cost-effective way is to just make it uh, available. Before I could, you know, mass produce CDs, the physical CD, and also uh, it's a little greener. I just didn't want to put all that plastic out there. Your album that's been available in, in digital form uh, since this past December. How long did it take you to make it? That story actually is is kind of yeah, kind of interesting. That week that we started and recorded the first two tracks, my son was diagnosed with a brain tumor, so it was put on hold for seven months and. It took about a year and a half, actually, all told, to uh, to finish it up. You were you were talking before about who who inspired you as a musician. Who were some of your influences as an actor? I uh, was in influenced by films of the early '70s, like uh, you know Clockwork Orange and and uh, you know the, the the Scorsese movies of the mid '70s. Uh, when I was in New York and I saw a uh, uh, Taxi Driver. Uh, I mean, it just, you know, at that point I just said, you know, I think this is what I want to do. You, who played Bill Buchanan on 24, uh, working on the set on a show like that, or, or any big motion picture, uh, how, how did that help any of your, uh, your personal projects? Well, the, the, by the time I got to, to 24 and season 4, halfway through season 4, they were just about where they, uh, they, had, they had developed this finely tuned precision machine. And I, and I say machine... But, but a human machine, so that they knew exactly how to shoot it, how to how to do what they they did so well, and it was just I mean it was precision, it was well oiled and worked together really well, and I and and most of that I think as I look at it now has had, had to do with the way John Cassar worked, and he brought a lot of his his artistry to that to creation of that, and I think now uh, in answer to your question, coming away from that, I just realized how efficiently and how collaboratively. It benefits everyone if you learn how to work together. I mean, if you if you involve everyone, if you don't, you know, decide that uh, oh, this person is, you know, who am I to this person now? As Jack O'Brien, the director, stage director, says in in our documentary, showing up. I think there's too much of that. If we're all just uh, workers among workers, and we're we're equals in this process, this collaborative process, without the power trips and without the secrets and you know whatever it is that flows downhill as they say then then the collaborative effort becomes as you see on on 24 you see uh, i mean the, the it was it was t 
it was tight. It was really tight, and they told the story really, really efficiently. And they shot it that way, too. Yeah, and, and you could tell. I think that 24 was, was one of the best shows that was on television. And, and you would see over the years all the people that would come in and all the people that pieced the show together. It's, it, it's truly remarkable how they would have new people come in and new cast members. I thought that was really interesting to work with all these different people that would come in all the time. Yeah, and the, you know, the other thing I noticed is when I, when I left the show, and I think probably everybody who was there for a while had this same uh, issue in their own way. I would go somewhere else, and they'd be working in, a, in whatever way they work, which is going to be different. And my first inclination would be to say, you know, on 24, we, uh, and, and I have to stop myself because, of course, you can't, you know, you're a guest, and you can't really tell them how, how best uh, to work. But you want to because they're, they're working inefficiently, and, and, you know, you sort of feel a little bit superior in a way. Like, you know, I, I, but then you have to, like you say, you have to make it how, how it works best for you, and you have to take whatever it is that you can actually, whatever you have personal control over and apply the things that you learned without imposing uh, that on somebody else. And I think that's where we get into trouble. We all bring those things where, you know, you gotta do it my way, my way or the highway, you know. But it takes time to develop that kind of ensemble feeling. So when you experience it, you know, you want it to be in, in everything, but it can't be. It's a very rare thing. It's like finding the one, that one true love in your life, uh, you know. That's the best thing about following on Twitter, and, and why everyone should follow at James P. Morrison, is that, is that I instantly get the impression of how well you work with the actors and the behind-the-scenes people. I mean, you, you probably work with just as much as the cast as the behind-the-scenes people, like, like the cameraman and everybody. You, you probably got to know them. And I see in your tweets that you're always tweeting to an assistant director or, or different people who are out there that you no longer probably work with, but you still thanks to Twitter, get to interact with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, that, that goes back to when I was about 21 years old, I was in the circus, I was a circus clown. And when I first got to the, the winter quarters in Hugo, Oklahoma, the performers sat on one side of the, the mess hall, the cafeteria, and the, the, the workers or the, the hands, you know, sat on the other side, and they never uh, interacted. So I got my plate and went over and sat with the the hands, you know, just to say hello. I mean, these are the guys that, you know, in some cases your life depends on, on them for rigging or, and, I mean, they're, they're the workers, you know. And I was immediately uh, reprimanded and ostracized and, you know, taken to task for mixing, you know, with the working stiff. And I just thought, man, first of all, is what built this country. This is the people that built this country. And they build, uh, they build the, the shows that we watch. And if you bring that work ethic to, it's the work ethic I learned from my dad, who was a, who worked in the construction business. You know, if you if you bring that work ethic to what you do, you know, we're all in this together. You you, you can't fail. And that's the impression that people uh, get when they when they log in, and and you have over five thousand followers that you know basically listen to what you say, and they and they have the option to get your ideas out there further, and and that's what I find truly inspirational, not only reading your tweets and, and getting to know you in kind of a different light, aside from watching you on television, you know, it, it's like getting into how you th kind of think, and it's inspiring, and and I, I'm thinking that it inspires a lot of people. So, my last and final question is, what advice would you give to aspiring actors and filmmakers? When I was a young actor, I, I wanted to, when I wanted to join uh, Actors' Equity, the, the, the union for stage actors, I... I uh, went to the director, artistic director of the Alaska Rep, where I was an apprentice. I was like 23 years old or something. And I said, I I'd, I'd like to do this. Can you help me do this? And, and he said, y you, uh, you, can't, you really can't think of anything else you'd rather do. And it was that, you know, that school of hard knocks sort of thing. And I said, no, you know, I really, no, I can't. I mean, I'm pretty sure I want to do this for a living. And he said, well, okay, yeah, and, you know, welcome to the ranks of the unemployable. And I, and I, I, I didn't, it didn't rec you know, register then, but what he was doing was showing me that there were going to be lots of people in the path on my journey to, through my life as an artist or as a man, uh, that are going to try to, you know, minimize my, my goal. If, if not giving me a hand up, uh, and certainly not a hand out, but, you know, there's a way to encourage people that sort of says, you know, if, if, this, is what you, if this is what you love and this is what makes you feel good, then you have to do it because you'll be unhappy if you don't. 
And it's that simple, really. It's, if, if what you're doing makes you happy, whether it's accepted, how it's received, uh, uh, all that stuff doesn't matter. If you place, you know, qualifiers, good or bad, before or after what you do, you're gonna you're gonna minimize your effort, your contribution, your your uh, journey that, that, that toward what you want to achieve, you know, and your pleasure in the moment. So, you know, be very sure, and and uh, that, that that first of all that that's that. That's what you want to do, like the guy said to me. Can you think of anything else? But also then you just go, you know, I'm not going to let anybody deter me from this. I'm not going to let them devalue me for whatever their personal agenda is. They're unhappy in their own lives or, you know, they're critics and that's their job to devalue or to, to feel like they can give something value based on their word or their appraisal of it. Like Stephen Spinella says in Showing Up, you, know, you, you have to take that into the room with you, you know, that, that sense of value of your own personal value. And that's, I think, the most important thing I could say is get ready to, to stand up for yourself and what you're, what you're putting out there. Just, you know, teach people how to treat you. That is very inspirational. I, I'm always impressed with what you say. I mean, I, I can't thank you enough. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. That was a pleasure talking to you. I'm glad this worked out. If I could jump in, uh, James and Richard, what, what is next for James uh, Morrison? Um, I just put together uh, the, the first performance with almost all of the band that I'm putting together at the Hotel Cafe in Hollywood. We'll be the musical guest with uh, some spoken word artists um, for a monthly thing they do there. So that's sort of the kickoff, the world tour kickoff in Hollywood. Uh, and, then I, and then we'll have a CD release party sometime uh, in August or September with the full band. And this is to promote the album uh, Son to the Boy, which is available on iTunes and CD Baby and uh, Amazon and all over the place digitally. So. Excellent. And if we would like more information on what you're up to, where do we get in touch? If you'd like to find out more about this, I usually uh, am, am pretty good about keeping the website up to date. It's uh, jpmorrison.com. And you can find out more about where we're playing and what will be happening with showing up the documentary uh, my wife and I just co-directed and co-produced about the uh, the actors audition we had a conversation with about 60 of our best uh, uh, working actors about what it means to them and uh, ultimately ends up being more about just showing up for for what you want to be and do in your life and we're very happy with it Richard thank you so much for bringing James as your guest today you're most certainly welcome and when folks want to see your stuff where do we see that well, the web series that I've currently produced, Curve Your Vampirism, you can watch at www.curveyourvampirism.blip.tv. That's it. Thanks for listening to the Spidcast Show. We appreciate your time and attention. You can now join the conversation at spidcast.com or on our Spidvid blog. And you can join our collaborative filmmaking community at spidvid.com. Tune in next month for another entertaining and informative episode 